Good morning, good morning, Sunday School. Today, May 23rd, 2011, uh, we're still in our spring quarter, 2021, Unit 3, Courageous Prophets of Change. Our title today is Ezekiel, a street preacher to the exile. Our adult topic is taking responsibility. Our lesson is coming from Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 9, verses 30 to 32. And our key verse is Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verse 4. Let us pray. Lord God of creation, give us the mind and the will to be responsible for our lives and our service. May we never look to others to find reasons to why we fail to carry out our assignment. Forgive us, we pray, in Jesus' name, creating us clean hearts and the right spirit. Amen. The book of Ezekiel was written by the prophet Ezekiel, and he was the son of a priest, dad named Buzzy. Uh, his name meant God will strengthen. And he was among 10,000 Jews that was exiled to Babylonia. Okay. And you can find that in 2 Kings, the 24th chapter, uh, verses 10 through 14. Ezekiel was a prophet and he was a priest. Now, in the second chapter of Ezekiel, they have the scripture where God called Ezekiel. And the spirit of the Lord came into Ezekiel and told Ezekiel to stand up on his feet. And he said, because I have a message that I want you to give to my people, Israel. He said, they are rebellious people and they are stiff hearted people. But you got to tell them what does say the Lord. He said, even though they might hear you and it might not hear you, but they will know that a prophet had been among them. So Ezekiel prophesied for 22 years. Ezekiel warned the people that the punishment was certain because of their sins. God will always punish sin. Ze Ezekiel was called son of man in the book of Ezekiel. And the only other person we know that was called son of man was Jesus Christ. So in the book of Ezekiel, we always would think of the vision of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, you know, wheel, when he saw that vision, the wheel in the middle of a wheel. Oh, one of the familiar chapters would be 37, the 37th chapter, where those preachers would be preaching on that valley of that dry bones. But today our lesson is coming from uh, chapter 18. So and they're telling us about how each person is responsible for their own sin. The children are not held responsible for the sins of their parent, nor the parent held responsible for the sins of their children. There was a misuse of that proverb during these early times of Israel. And Ezekiel had to preach to them and tell them how they had to take responsibility for their own sin. So our lesson starts in that 18th chapter with verse one. I'm gonna read verse one and two. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, what mean is ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, the father has eaten sour grapes and the children teeth are set on age. What does that mean? So it was the word of the Lord. Ezekiel was speaking what thus said the Lord. He emphasized that it was the Lord who had spoke. God was communicating to them, even though they were in exile, God had given Ezekiel a message to give to those children of Israel, okay? In verse two, when he said, what mean is that? What is this proverb? And a proverb is just a common saying that they were saying over and over. And it had some truth, but it wasn't all true. And what they were saying was that the father had eaten the sour grapes, 
but the children's teeth are set on edge. Now listen at this. The fathers are the one who eat the grapes, but the children are the one who feeling the, the pain from it. Like uh, if you eat sour, sour, sour grapes, and if you ever eat them, you know it kind of put your teeth on edge. And so what they were saying, their father had eaten the grapes, but it's the children teeth that was put on edge. So what the people of Judah had believed, they were being punished for the sins of their ancestors. What they had done generation and generation before, now they were in exile. And with everything that was going on, if you read about it, you would know how 10,000s or more of them was captured. The king was captured and uh, all the things that the destruction that was going to go on. And they felt like they weren't at fault for it. They were being blamed for something that they hadn't done. But uh, if you go back in uh, time and read the Ten Commandments, uh, if they didn't misconstrue what was being taught by Moses from God, the Ten Commandments, when God gave the first of the Ten Commandments, he talked about how he was a jealous God, how you shouldn't have no other God before him, and how you shouldn't make up no golden image. When he said in that fifth verse, for I am the Lord, and I am a jealous God, he said, I would visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. So he's saying if the generation would turn to the false gods and they would turn away from me, it'll be such a bad sin that will trickle on down. Not it's just generation after generation that keep doing the same thing over and over. It'll take generations to clear all that up. And look how long that has been since they had gotten the Ten Commandments and they still some of them was worshiping idol gods. So Ezekiel, he is addressing an incorrect understanding in Israel that if the father sinned, the son would bear the iniquity of the sin. The people thought that they were suffering unjustly for their ancestors. Uh, a lot of times that has happened. Uh, you can go all the way back to Genesis in the third chapter when the Lord God called for Adam and asked Adam, where are thou? And Adam said, oh, I heard your voice, but I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And when the Lord asked him, who told you you was naked? You know, have you eaten up the tree where I commanded you that you should not eat? What did uh, Adam say? The woman you gave me. And when, when God confronted the woman, what did she say? The serpent uh, beguiled me and I did eat. So the blame game has always been passed on from one to another. And this is the subject that Ezekiel has to address. I just want to say to us that whatever, whatever our foreparents had done in the past, it might impact our lives, but it does not rule our lives. God has a way of turning things around. Every generation has the capacity to do different than whatever your grandparents did before you. Truly, some things are passed down, some are good and some are bad. But we have the Holy Spirit. If we know Jesus, whatever happened yesterday, our God is a God of today. If we would just turn it over to Jesus, there is nothing that's too hard for our God. Oh, bless his name. Is there anything too hard for God? The answer is no. What the songwriter say? This problem that I had and I just couldn't seem to solve. I prayed and I prayed, but I just kept getting deeper involved. But when I turn it over to Jesus and I stopped worrying about it, I gave it over to the Lord. And what happened? He worked it out. God is a right now God. And whatever our problem is, we give it over to the Lord. And he truly will work it out. So Ezekiel had to work on these children. And they were still in exile. And so that third verse said, as I live, said the Lord. He's speaking through Ezekiel. You will not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. The Lord is saying, this is an oath. I mean, I'm going to straighten this out today. 
you will no longer be able to say whatever the fathers did, the sin fell on the children, and we are suffering because of the sin of what our fathers did. Now, we know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, okay? So God is saying in verse 4, which is our key verse, behold, look, all souls are mine. Every last soul belongs to God. Why? Because God breathed the breath of life in Adam into man, and man became a living soul. He's the sovereign creator of man. He's the giver of life. So this includes his chosen people as well as the Babylonians. He said, as the soul of the father, so as, so as the soul of the son, the son is mine, the father is mine. That's generation after generation. I don't care if you go all the way back to Adam and come all the way down to me and you. We all belong to God. We are his. He is our keeper. And I'm so glad he's a keeper. I know him to be a keeper. And so he has the right to declare this big statement that he's going to make. He said, the soul that sent it, it shall die. Not your father, not your mother, but the soul that sinned. If you live in sin and keep on sinning, you're going to die in your sins and in hell you will lift your eyes. But he has a way of escape. He has another way for you. He has a way out for you. And we who are under grace know that that way is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it was pointless for the exile to say that they were innocent because Romans 3 and 23 says, all have sinned, A-L-L, all. And I don't care if you use it in Hebrew. I don't care if you use it in Greek. I don't care if you use it in Latin. I don't care what language you use the word A-L-L, all mean all. So all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But thanks be to God today, we relate to God with a new and a better covenant. We are under the age of grace. Every one of us, one day going to give an account of our behavior to God. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the thing that has been done in his body, according to what he has done, whether it be good or whether it be bad, you still gonna have to stand before God one day. So God is letting them know, I'm not gonna hold nobody accountable for another person's sin. Each person is accountable for what they do. Your forefathers, those ancestors before you, generation after generation, whatever we are saying, it doesn't work like that. God is teaching and he's saying to us, the soul that sinned, it, it shall die. Whoever sinned, you are accountable for your own sin. And you know, all uh, those old folks said that old saying, every tub got to stand on his own bottle. So each person got to stand for themselves. Mama can't stand, daddy can't stand. I got to stand and I got to stand for myself. And so in those verses from five to nine, we see that God is going to give them a, a, a view, a portrait of a just man, someone who's doing right and someone he considers uh, just. And so verse five says, if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right and has not eaten upon the mountain, neither has he lifted his eyes up to idols of the house of Israel, neither defiled his neighbor's wife, neither has come near to a menstruous woman. They're saying if a man is just, if a man is righteous, if he observed God's law with all his heart, he doing that which is right. I read in Micah 6 chapter and the 8th verse, it said, he has shows the old man what is good and what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. 
Now we have tried all kinds of ways to please God, but God has made his wishes clear. He wants us as his people to be fair. He wants us to be just and merciful. He wants us to walk humbly with him. So in our efforts, when we are trying to please God, we need to examine ourselves and are we are fair when we deal with people? Do we show mercy to those who wrong us? Are we learning to live in humility? We need to, we need to, I say, take that mirror, mama, and look at ourselves and see how are we just? Because God is teaching us a way that a just man should live. And he wants us to be lawful and he wants us to be right. And he said they didn't uh, eat on the mountains and they didn't lift up their eyes to uh, idols. They uh, wasn't worshiping idol gods. And they said during that time, they used to go up on the mountain on a grove and they would have all kinds of things that was going on that wasn't correct. And so, but we know Psalm 121 tell us that I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. All of my help comes from the Lord. So we know not to lift our eyes to any hours. And so the man didn't defile his wife, nor came near a menstruous woman. He knew not to commit adultery and he knew a menstruous woman was ceremonially unclean, and he knew that uh, in the Leviticus, life was in the blood, so he didn't take part of anything that was ceremonial unclean, okay? In the seventh verse, he did mission work. He didn't oppress any. He didn't uh, take advantage of anybody. And he restored to the depths of his pledge. That means whatever was borrowed from him, and they paid it back, he accepted them. And when they say uh, he restored their pledge, that means, I'm going to give you an example, like if I had borrowed $100 from you and you asked me for something to hold for collateral and I have a bracelet that I really love and I'll let you hold my bracelet. When I come back and pay you your $100, if you want to be fair with me, you're not going to keep my bracelet. You're going to give it back to me because I paid you the debt what I owe you. And so that's being just and that's being fair. Okay. He didn't lift up his eyes to idols. Okay. And neither did he defile his neighbor's wife, didn't commit adultery. He didn't spar none with violence. He didn't take advantage of any. He gave them bread to eat. And also he closed the naked. That was the mission work. He took care of the people. He didn't oppress the poor, the widows or the orphan. He didn't bully anybody, okay? He paid off his debt and he didn't pile up bad debts upon them and make them pay more than what uh, he had taken from them, okay? Verse eight says somewhat of the same thing. He did not give them food upon usury, meaning he didn't take advantage of them. He didn't make them pay back more than what they borrowed. If I borrowed $100, I didn't have to pay back $125, okay? He didn't add, he didn't increase, okay? He didn't take advantage, okay? That had was withdrawn uh, his hand from iniquity, okay? He wasn't uh, unrighteous with the people, okay? He didn't abuse the people, all right? He had excellent judgment. He executed what? Judgment that was right between man. He didn't show favoritism, okay? Between man and man, when he had to make a decision, he made an accurate and right decision. So verse nine say, this man is just because he has walked in my statutes. He has kept my judgment. He deals truly, he is just. He shall surely live, say the Lord God. This is a just man. This is a righteous man. This is someone who's doing what is right. He's keeping the commandments. He's keeping God's law. He's a righteous man. And so this man shall surely live, okay? And so you need to read verses 10 through 29 because it tell you about two other generations generation how another man had a son, but the son was wicked and the father was righteous. And so it, uh, 
They're still talking about generation. So Ezekiel had to explain that to them. And then in from verses 14 to 18, they was talking about how the son was a righteous son and the father was wicked. But God judged each one. If you were righteous in verse 20, it said that if you was righteous, if the soul that sinned, it, it was going to die. So the son would not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither was the father going to bear the iniquity of the son. The righteous was going to have the righteous upon them and the wicked was going to have the wicked upon them. And I would encourage you to read those verses and then you will better understand how God really explained through Ezekiel the right and wrong with these generation to generation and how the thought was so wrong to think that uh, whoever sinned, it would fall upon someone else. Everybody had to be accountable for their own sin. Now, the latter part, God, Ezekiel is saying, thus says the Lord, you need to repent. You need to repent before it's too late because the day of judgment is coming. There's going to come a time when it's going to be saved too late. So while we have a chance, we need to repent now. Ezekiel 18 and 30 said, therefore, so if you say therefore, that means you got to go back to everything from all the previous statements regarding God's standards of judgment. And all that is found in those verses I asked you to read. He said, therefore, I'll judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. He said, I'm going to be the judge. I am the righteous judge. So what I need you to do is to repent and turn yourself from all of your transgressions. So these iniquities shall not be the cause you get destroyed. I need you to do that which is right and pleasing in my sight. I need you to repent, mean make a complete turnaround. Oh, glory to God. If you were going to the left, Turn completely around and go to the right. We want to do that which is pleasing unto God. Verse 31 say, cast away from you all your transgression. It's almost saying the same thing with the, the, first, the verse 30 say. I want you to repent and turn yourself from all your transgression. He said, well, by you have transgressed. He said, Look what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to make you a new heart and a new spirit. So why you want to die in your sins, oh Israel? Look, when God is the only one who could give you that new heart and that new spirit, and when God come into your life, into your heart, I don't care who you are, what you have done, if you open up your heart and let God come in, what the scripture say in Romans 12, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of your God, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. He said, that's your reasonable strength. They're not asking you anything hard to do. God just said, give me your heart and I'll give you eternal life. When you open up your heart and let Jesus Christ come in, salvation take place and you get renewed, that transformation start taking place. God will turn that thing completely around. Whatever it is, whatever it was, because it's not going to be no more. You're supposed to be a changed person. What we say to him, a change, a change. Oh, what a wonderful change has come over me. And God is asking Israel, repent, repent, turn from your transgressions. Do you want to die? I, I got something new for you. He told them in Ezekiel 36 and 26, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to put a new spirit in you. And I tell you, when God put that new heart in you and that new spirit in you, it makes a wonderful change come in your life. What that old blues singer used to sing, the things that you used to do, you don't even want to do them no more. Places you used to go, you don't want to go that no more. Things you used to say out your mouth, you don't even say that no more. Thoughts you had in your heart, you don't even have them anymore. A wonderful change has come over me. And so our last verse say, for I have no pleasure. God is speaking through Ezekiel. I have no pleasure in the death of him that died, said the Lord. Wherefore, turn yourself and live. God is still pleading. Ezekiel is still pleading. 
Repent. Don't blame nobody else. Don't play the blame game. Stop blaming other people for the mistakes that we are making in our lives. Take that mirror moment, look at ourselves. What is it that I'm doing that I need to be doing better? Better. God created us for eternal life. We are his creation. Each person must decide for himself that we can either have life or we can have death. We must choose. It's our choice. Psalm 116 and 15 said, precious is the sight of the Lord, is the death of the saints. And in 2 Peter 3 and 9, that latter part, he said, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so pastor has always taught us 2 Corinthians 10 and 13. He said, there is now no temptation taken to you, but it's common to man. He said, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. He said, but with the temptation, he will give you a way of escape that you will be able to bear. So God is a forgiving God. It doesn't matter what our sin is or was. God is standing with an outstretched arm, just ready and just waiting. He wants us to live for him. And the biggest thing that God had with Israel was repent. And today in the New Testament under grace, the message has not changed. It's still repent. In Matthew, the third chapter, when John the Baptist came on the scene, the first words that came out of his mouth when John came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, the first thing he said was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus himself was here preaching, he would say, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. When Peter preached that day and all those souls was added to the church, Peter preached, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Repent, turn from your evil ways. All of the chastisement that came upon Israel was for the purpose of causing them to repent. We got to remember God is a jealous God. He don't want us to have no other God before him. God gave Israel every chance to repent, to repent. Their unrepentant spirit, their unrepentant sins are what caused them to be in the situation in exile in Babylon where they were. Now, when the disciples in the New Testament asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment for us to keep? He told them there are just two. You got to love the Lord, thy God, with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And the second is lacking them to it. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. So if we really truly love God and we repent and live for God, the heart of us going to be ready to obey God and to keep his commandments fully, God promised us, he promised us that he'll take care of us. He would give the people new hearts, one capable of being sensitive and obedient to his word. But what they had to do, repent, change your mind, change your attitude, make a change in your decision making. Repent and live. Repent and live. One more time. Repent and live. So Ezekiel was a prophet and he was in exile, but he did preach to the children of Israel, letting them know that God is a just God and God is a fair God and God is not going to have you to all uh, pay for the sins of no one else. Every person is accountable to God and every person got to give an account for the sins in their own body, not the sins of no one else, but the sin that you've committed. Okay. This is our Sunday school lesson for today. May God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer. Thank you.